I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Jennifer Redmond Knight, who's with us today. She is a facilitator and public health professional who helps leaders responsible for coalitions, just like ours, partnerships and teams figure out how to get people to work better together so that they can make a greater impact together than they could on their own. And I think that's that's a perfect example of what we try to do at the Iowa Cancer Consortium. So everybody who's involved in the consortium, um, we are all tasked with working together to make a greater impact. So this is very timely. We're glad to have Jennifer here. Uh, Jennifer does this work through her consulting business, as well as her role as an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health and a member of the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center Cancer Control Program. She serves as co-principal investigator for the Kentucky Cancer Consortium, so she's very familiar with the work that's done here in Iowa, co-principal investigator for the implementation of quality lung cancer screening component of Kentucky LEADS, and principal investigator for a self-made health network grant focused on lung cancer health equity among predominantly male, male work sites. Dr. Redmond Knight has experience and interest in group facilitation, partnership sustainability, leadership, emotional intelligence, which we're learning about today, program development, evaluation, cancer prevention and control, epidemiology, and policy systems and environmental change efforts. In 2017, she launched a website and weekly blog focused on helping people work better together, which I will type into the chat box here in a moment, at jredmondknight.com. Dr. Knight has her BA in communications from Washita Baptist University, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, an MPH in epidemiology from the University of Kentucky College of Public Health in Lexington, and um, a doctor of public health in health services management from the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. So without further ado, you can all hear why we've invited her to be here uh, today. So Jennifer, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. I am excited to be here with you guys. And, um, and I will say I've learned how to say you guys because uh, you may or may not realize I didn't put this in the bio, but I was actually born in Iowa in Waterloo. So I have an Iowa connection was there um, as a young girl. And every time I went to visit my family uh, in Iowa, I grew up in Arkansas. And I said, y'all and they said, what? And so I tried to get better at you guys. Uh, so thank you for having me today. Uh, I want to start with just telling you guys a story. My very first Kentucky Cancer Consortium meeting uh, was just quite an experience. Um, it was in a large room. We were in a U shape, you know, as many meetings are. But as you looked around the room, everybody was completely miserable. They just kind of were growling and grumpy and disengaged. And, and the reason I really remember that is because they took pictures that day. And so they were trying to show how people were working together and those pictures just spoke a thousand words. It was really dreadful uh, and really painful. And I don't know about if you guys have been there, um, probably not as part of the Iowa Cancer Consortium, but I bet you've had that experience in other places and oh, it's painful. Uh, and really, I didn't at the time know that that even could be connected to something called emotional intelligence. But a few years later, I really learned, oh, that has an emotional intelligence component, especially the emotional awareness piece that really um, talks about, you know, paying attention to others. And oh, it relates to coalition building in a major, major way. So let's get started. And let me advance my slides. There we go. So what is emotional intelligence? As you heard from the introduction, um, I've been connected with the universities for a long time. So as you can imagine, there's all kinds of great definitions that we could look into, um, complicated definitions, even whether or not it can be learned or uh, whether or not it's just innate. And we won't get into that. Thankfully today, you're probably very relieved. Um, my favorite definition is pretty simple. And that is this. It is recognizing, understanding, and managing our emotions, and recognizing, understanding, and influencing the emotions of others. Basically, it's recognizing that we all have emotions, and they have an impact, whether we realize it or not. Uh, and they have an impact on ourselves, and they have an impact on our relationships, too. 
Now, what I'll say it's not is it's not about being emotional or somebody who cries all the time. It's not about just being a feeler. For those of you who are familiar with the Myers-Briggs um, type indicator, uh, one of the areas is, are you a thinker or a feeler? So how do you best make your decisions? Is it with your head or with your heart? This is different. Even though you may make your decisions with your head or your heart, um, you still have emotions either way. And part of what emotional intelligence is, is really kind of understanding that first in ourselves uh, and then being able to understand and work with that in others. Now, one component too that's important to consider in emotional intelligence is it is not about manipulating others either. So you see the word influence the emotions of others and you may think, ooh, is this about manipulating somebody to get my way? No, <laughs> it should not be. That's not emotional intelligence, that's manipulation. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about a little bit of those components and we can absolutely discuss some questions and answers that may be related to that piece as well. So um, going in a little bit more about what emotional intelligence is, I like to kind of break it out into three main areas. Um, these areas are gonna be know yourself. So in this place, you know, we really need to understand what ourself is and what ourselves are, who ourselves are, what our emotions are, and, and are we managing those? You know, the next piece is recognizing what is happening with others. So it's paying attention in the room. You know, is somebody in that room um, grumpy? Or are they happy? Or are they displeased? Or are they completely disconnected from the conversation? Uh, emotional intelligence is kind of getting a sense of what might be going on there. and What are the emotions that might be impacted? And then the third kind of component I like to say is then interacting positively with others. When you know yourself, you know others, you're paying attention to others and the emotions that are happening in that place, then you have the opportunity to interact positively with others. So, um, one of the ways I like to show it was with this video. Um, so I'm gonna click on the video and hopefully it will come up for us. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy? fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, a very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So 
we've seen a little bit about what emotional intelligence is. So why is it important in coalition building? Well, there's several reasons. Let's see. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really telling um, and, and something that I've experienced just recently, I was at a conference and at this conference, um, we went to a session on lung cancer screening. And I don't know about you guys, but you probably are kind of discussing it amongst yourselves and there's a lots of different perspectives perhaps on this. And in this particular session, uh, it was absolutely um, filled with people in the room who were kind of experts, if you will, but many experts who did not agree with each other at all. Um, at least they were known not to agree with each other. And so after several presentations, the, the final speaker also facilitated a session. And, you know, I was kind of waiting on, you know, the edge of my seat going to say, how's this going to go down? Because it could have had been very heated. There could have been lots of disagreements you know, lots of intense things because there was a lot of perspectives that may be very different. Well, this leader and facilitator, knowing his audience being very diverse, um, brought up the potentially contentious subjects and the different perspectives in a very calm manner. He talked about the different possibilities that could be happening. He really talked about, you know, um, what, why one thing might work and another might not. And, just really said we have a lot to learn. What was amazing is everyone in that room was willing to really talk about these issues in a positive way, in a productive way. It did not get heated at all. And as a matter of fact, you know, the session ended and I thought, we need to keep talking about this. This is such a productive conversation. And so, you know, that's where I thought, this is emotional intelligence in action. And this is so important in coalition building because what happens is we are engaging in a lot of different discussions and some of them we may completely agree with, some of them we may not. We all have the same interest oftentimes in helping people no longer get cancer or catch it earlier or diagnose it better or improve quality of life. And so, you know, these kind of traits are really important when we're trying to bring these people together to do more together than we could by ourselves. So, you know, I'm wondering, and, and we'll discuss in the question time, have you had this experience? Um, knowing Kelly and Tessa already, you probably have, uh, but you know, maybe not. Maybe there's some things you're like, oh, I'd like to have that experience. So a little bit more about the why it's important. Uh, it's really important when it comes to leadership. So emotional intelligence and leadership go hand in hand. Uh, a group called the Center for Creative Leadership has done some research on um, why leaders fail. And in some of the research, just kind of organizing it very briefly, they found that 23% of the reasons that leaders fail tends to be related to a lack of emotional intelligence or emotional intelligence kind of components. 11% of the reasons that leaders fail relate to a lack of technical competence. So many times we're so focused on those technical components that we may miss the emotional intelligence pieces that are so critical for leadership. And one of my favorite definitions of effective leadership is the successful application of influence to followers to achieve the leaders and the group's objectives. And part of that is really characterized by genuinely caring for people and enhancing positive feelings among followers. As you saw in the video, um, showing empathy, genuinely caring for people, um, whether it relates to the organizational um, focus areas or whether it relates to them as a person, that genuine care has a really great impact on leadership. And we know leadership is critical for coalition building. Um, so that is one key piece. And, and really the leader sets the tone as it comes for emotional intelligence. So leader needs to really understand his or her own emotions, how they're managing them, and really setting the tone for the entire group. The really, the key element that may separate average from best leaders um, is often emotional intelligence. So that's one of the reasons it's important in coalition building. Another reason it's really important is it's relationships. Uh, you know, coalition building is really all about relationship building. And I know you all know this. You're involved in it every day. Um, you're doing this. I remember when I first started in public health, 
uh, the folks around me kept saying, it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. And that's true. And I know you guys have experienced that too. Uh, when you have emotional intelligence, you have the skills that allow you to be more successful to both build and maintain relationships that is so critical in coalition building. Uh, you really are able to pay attention to others and how they respond to you and then make adjustments in your words or your behavior moving forward that maintains those relationships that are so critical to being part of the coalition. So another reason why it's important is trust. Uh, people want to work with those that they trust. And so, you know, in that piece, um, you know, you are going to be able to be more vulnerable, more open, more honest, more respected, uh, more supported. And, you know, that then becomes the short list of people to work with. I'm working on a project right now uh, that's really struggling in this area. It's got three different components to it. And one of the components, without telling anybody else, decided to pursue a funding opportunity. Uh, and they were successful. So they successfully got funded related to work that's kind of connected to the rest of us, but didn't tell us or kind of told us through an email when somebody was on vacation, oh yeah, I might be doing something like this. And now um, the group is really struggling with how do we move forward together? Can we trust that they're going to keep communicating with us? Or can they trust that they're not going to compete with funding opportunities? So the trust piece is super important in coalition building. And, you know, the communication piece is a huge piece of that. Uh, and again, people want to work with those who they trust. So another reason why it's important in coalition building is engagement. As you know, especially those of you who are leading work groups or leading um, the coalition overall, you want people to actively participate during meetings. And one of the ways you can do that is by demonstrating emotional intelligence. It really allows you to pay attention to what's going on in the room. It may be as simple as looking and seeing that people's eyes are glazed over and they're so in need of a bathroom break. So you take a break <laughs> and you say, okay, it's time to take a break. The other way that this can um, happen is the way that you respond to people during meetings. You know, do you respect what they say and what they bring up? Do you show positive um, feedback when people are willing to participate? And so then that makes other people also willing to participate during the meeting. You know, conversely, the best way to become disengaged, and I've had to be careful at this, I've learned over time, you know, is especially the leader, how you respond to questions or dissension or things like that. If you immediately shut somebody down or say, nope, that's not the evidence, or nope, this isn't gonna work, then your chances for people, other people chiming in are gonna go down considerably because they're not sure they can really engage and be positively um, productive in that engagement. So uh, emotional intelligence, again, is critical from the engagement standpoint. The other place, um, that this is important is productivity, which of course everybody says, well, I, you know, we're really trying to increase that colon cancer screening rate to 80% by this year, right? 2018. Um, or we are really trying to reduce tobacco use, or we are trying to get everybody's homes tested for radon. You know, if we're going to be able to move forward on those collective ways, the emotional intelligence piece is critical. And it kind of relates to some of the other areas, the trust, the engagement, uh, the relationships, and so when you have emotional intelligence, you're able to kind of catch some of these potential dissension areas before they get too big. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have experienced that sometimes if there's a lot of just frustration or, or struggle in something and nobody is addressing it, it really hinders your ability to move forward productively. Uh, but with emotional intelligence, it doesn't mean that you avoid things. You just kind of address those things. And you address them um, respectfully. You know, one of the things that, um, and we'll get into this as we kind of apply things a little more, that I found really helpful showing emotional intelligence for productivity is when there's tension is acknowledge it in a calm way or sometimes in a humorous way. I mean, you can just, you can know the situation and say, oh man, something's got to give here. And in that, you kind of break open the opportunity to have the discussion and keep things moving forward productively toward your ultimate goals, which are so critical. And you don't want things like um, just gruntled folks or um, sideline conversations to get in the way of that. So it really helps the whole team become more productive when you've got emotional intelligence. 
So um, as a follow-up, you know, I think it is so important for us to improve emotional intelligence skills. And as I said in one of the other earlier slides, there are some folks who struggle with whether that's possible, uh, but I do think it's possible. I've seen it happen. Um, I myself have improved my emotional intelligence skills and have learned a lot along the way. And so uh, one of the things that I really think is critically important as we do these trainings and have these conversations is that we focus on those practical things we can do to really improve it. You know, we could talk all day long about how important it is, but if we're not able to improve it, then what? So I want to take you guys back to my first story, uh, really talking about what I would call the miserable meeting. <laughs> you know, we're sitting in that meeting and, and not long after that meeting, I was actually hired to be the program director um, for the consortium. And so in that place, as I'm kind of going, oh my goodness, what do we do? I realized we needed to do something. There were about 12 members at the time um, of the consortium who had kind of stuck with us. And even though they were disengaged and they were frustrated, they were still showing up. Now it may have been because their organization said they still had to show up, um, but they really thought, you know, I'm still gonna show up, but I don't know if I'm gonna keep getting involved. And so what I realized is we need to get to know what's going on. Again, address the emotions that are going on and the perspectives of these people. Uh, and we really knew that moving forward as a group, we needed people to want to come. You know, I don't know about the Iowa Cancer Consortium, but for Kentucky, most of the people who come represent different organizations who may have a, an interest in cancer prevention and control. And some of these um, folks, you know, may supposed to be there because of their job, but a lot of times they're really volunteers as members of the consortium. You know, so their work may relate to different cancer areas, but they don't have to show up to meetings. So we knew that if we were going to make a difference moving forward collectively, that we wanted to get them to a place where they wanted to show up again. So one of the things that we really did um, is we connected, and I say we, um, I was able at the same time I was hired to hire our program coordinator, um, Katie Beachy, who is phenomenal. Um, you guys may get to meet her at some point. Um, but she also happens to be a licensed professional counselor, which I highly recommend um, having somebody in your life or on your team who is a professional counselor. It's really a great skill. And that person is constantly improving their emotional intelligence as well and can help coach you in that. So what we did in order to move forward is we met with each of these 12 people and we asked them three different questions. We said, what's working? What's not working? And what are your recommendations? And we really listened. And we recognized that a lot of what we needed to do was listen. There was a lot of frustration, a lot of emotion, a lot of things going on that we just needed to pay attention to, acknowledge it, and recognize this is what's going on. Well, what we discovered in that process is that everybody said very similar things. There were more things alike than we ever thought possible. Uh, and really people agreed on where we needed to go, what needed to happen. So we organized that, we summarized that, and we took action on that um, in a respectful way as possible. And in that process, people said, oh yeah, okay, maybe I do want to get involved. Yes, let's move forward. And as of today, um, as our consortium overall membership, not including different work groups, and we have more than 70 different organizations that said, yeah, I'm in. Um, and within our other teams and networks, we've got 150 and some kind of saying, yes, I'm in. And we keep learning and keep growing in that. So it's possible for you to do that too. So let's talk about how. So one of the best ways um, I would suggest is to ask for feedback. Similar to what we did with that group. We did one-on-one -on -one meetings. So that may be a way um, you want to do it. But there's a kind of a couple of different sources of feedback that I think can be helpful. So again, as I talked about emotional intelligence, you really starts with you. You've got to recognize, understand, and be aware of your own emotions and how you manage those. Uh, one of the best ways you can get some feedback on that is from trust, trusted friends and colleagues. These are going to be people who will provide you honest feedback, but yet constructive feedback. These are not people who are going to just beat you down and um, cause you to be just frustrated and more dis, 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 disappointed and disengaged. These are people who are going to say, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you so that you can grow. You're actually wanting to grow. 
Um, so I'm going to be there for you. One of my favorite authors, and you'll probably hear me several times throughout this series mention him, um, is Stephen Covey. And I think his seven habits of highly effective people can apply to coalitions in all kinds of places. And one of the things that I think he reminds us is seek first to understand, then be understood. And so as you're talking to your friends and colleagues, or when you're talking to your coalition or work group members, one of the things we did with these 12 is we said, we need to first understand and then be understood. So we asked those questions. We believe the best in them. And we really tried to say, how can we improve? One way that you might do it as well, particularly in a coalition or work group setting with your overall group. So kind of how are things going with paying attention to others and relationships with others? You may try to do an anonymous survey where you can ask a few specific questions to get feedback on how the emotional intelligence is going and what areas you can be improving in. Another way um, that you can improve, and we can all improve really emotional intelligence skills is by observing. Now this can look differently in different places. So one way, maybe during a meeting, you can observe what may be going on. Uh, those nonverbal expressions say so much about what might be happening. Uh, you know, and one of those people pieces in that nonverbal may also be, are they just focused on their phones or their computers? I don't know about you, but one of the most discouraging places to be is when you're presenting to a group of people and everybody is just looking down at their phones, you know, and you think, okay, this is really discouraging. Uh, and so in that place, paying attention to that and being able to address that can be huge. You can recognize, are people displeased? Are people really happy? Are they enthused? Are they excited? I'll never forget, I presented to a group in Little Rock, Arkansas recently, and, uh, and it was probably 50 people in the room, and I was talking about a smoke-free opportunity and, and discussing that, and everybody was paying attention and nodding their heads, and I was just like, wow, this is great. They are engaged. This is resonating. This is really working, so pay attention to those nonverbal. Also pay attention to the words spoken and the questions asked, including the tone of voice. You know, if somebody is asking you a question and you can tell they really want to know the answer, they're, they're just really inquisitive. Other folks may ask a question and you can tell they are just trying to trap you in something and they are mad about something. So paying attention to what that is can really help you improve your emotional intelligence skills. And then watch positive examples. Uh, see what they do, see how they interact with groups and try to imitate them. So like I mentioned the conference that I went to, I'm thinking about how this um, facilitator leader led that difficult conversation and I'm trying to imitate him. He was very calm in his voice. And I thought that was really a helpful way to improve our emotional intelligence. And then the third kind of main area that I think is so critical, and that is to reflect. And I know in today's society, in our go, go, go mode, it is really hard to take the time to reflect. So the first piece is to pause. And again, I don't know about you, but when I sit down, sometimes it takes me a minute to really truly pause and not feel like I need to check my phone or see what's happening, you know, in the other room. Uh, it is just tricky. And so that pause time, not looking at devices, but just pausing, perhaps deep breathing. I know my mom used to always tell me when I was young, take 10 deep breaths. And I hated that advice, but she's right. I mean, that really can help us especially if we're in an intense situation, just take some deep breaths that can help us particularly manage our own emotions and, and ourselves, and then also get a sense of what may ha be happening in that room. You know, again, um, Stephen Covey, I'll mention him again, he talks about something called sharpen the saw, which really focuses on helping you um, reflect and grow in different areas. And so again, that pause allows that. It also allows you to think about how have your relationships gone lately? How have your meetings been? How have your work group situations and interactions been? What's going on in that? The next piece of that reflection is to acknowledge the emotions. This may be an individual setting. This may be in a group setting. And it's both your own emotions as well as others. And those may differ. You may have a lot of different things happening. You may have half the room super excited about what's going on and really engaged and happy and moving forward. You might have the other half that it's just, you can tell disengaged, frustrated, and think they're not being heard. So it's important to acknowledge both, you know, if you have that situation. I'm um, kind of going back to my miserable meeting and follow-up. Uh, one of the things that we experienced is that um, 
when we presented kind of here is what we're doing to move forward and everybody move forward collectively, the folks who were leading it at the time were angry. So like I had all 11 people in the room who were like, yeah, this is where we need to go. And that other one or two people really, who you could tell, like, I mean, I just felt like daggers were being sent in my direction. And that was really difficult. And I needed to acknowledge that. And it took some time to really work on that relationship in a one-on-one -on -one setting, honestly. So again, keep acknowledging what might be going on. And then as part of that reflection too, I encourage you to take notes on what worked well and what you would like to do differently. So in that, you know, you may spend five minutes a day or you may spend an hour a week. It doesn't have to be a long time and don't take, you know, no shame in how long it may take you. But the reality is it really helps to just make some notes or you may have a planner. I'm back to a paper planner. Um, and so in my day, I like to take notes on what worked well and, and in my week, what I'd like to do differently. So kind of reflecting on those past meetings and those past interactions, that's how we can improve. So now there's a little bit of time for questions and then we'll follow up with a few more reminders and action steps. So questions, Kelly, Tessa, what do we have for questions? You bet. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, there are a couple ways you can do that. Uh, you can raise your hand. There should be a raise hand button on your screen. You can type it into the chat box or you can use that Q&A function. Um, we do have one question while we're waiting for others to, to raise their hands or ask questions um, that's come in. It's from Kelly Hendershot, who I think had to jump off, but we'll make sure to get her answer to her. Um, the question is, how much do personality traits, how much do personality traits, if at all, factor into emotional intelligence? That's a great question. You know, I think that um, it, it depends. You know, I think that there's a lot of personality traits that can make people, um, make it a little easier for people. So uh, kind of going back to even the Myers-Briggs piece, if you are a feeler versus a thinker in terms of how you make your decisions first, um, sometimes a feeler, it could go both ways. A feeler may be more empathetic and they may be able to pay attention to others and recognize, Ooh, something's going on here. Um, but they may have trouble managing their emotions. So there's a piece there where as the thinker may be able to kind of pause and say, I'm not going to suddenly react how I feel right now. I'm going to think about it and then recognize the emotions. So really it could go either way. I think that uh, there's personalities that may make it more easy or difficult at times, but I think for one component of emotional intelligence, it may be easier, but for the other, it may be more difficult. Uh, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Gabby has asked, is, do you have advice on helping emotional intelligence within a coalition if you are not the leader of the group? Ooh, that is a great, great question. You know, one of the things that I think you can do, even if you're not the prescribed leader, is to demonstrate leadership within the meetings. So one of the things that you can do, and I've done this before too, because it can be kind of wonky. Like I've had a leader at times and they're like going off in left field and they, they have no idea what's happening. What I have said is I've raised my hand and I said, you know, it seems like there might be a lot of tension around this issue. Do you think we could pause for a second and have a conversation about, you know, why we should move forward in this direction or why this might be a difficult decision to make? And so um, what I would say is be a leader for emotional intelligence wherever you are, regardless of whether your title says leader. Uh, the other thing that can be helpful in that, and this again, a great question, is to perhaps after the meeting or after a situation, if you can schedule some time and build a relationship with that leader, and if that leader is open um, to situations, just kind of debrief on the meeting. Say, I would love to kind of debrief on how this went. Um, how did you think it went? You know, and kind of start with the seek first to understand and then be understood piece. Uh, and then in that, then maybe um, perhaps provide a little bit of feedback if it's possible to say, you know, I feel like there might be some stuff going on in the room that we didn't really address. I wonder if next time we look at it a little differently. And again, that depends on who that leader is, but I think a one-on-one -on -one setting might be helpful too. Thank you. Other questions? Again, you can ask via the Q&A button, which is down at the bottom of your screen most likely, 
Um, there's also a chat button you can use to ask a question or if you want to raise your hand, um, you're welcome to do it that way too. Maybe we'll pause here just a moment to give Absolutely. a chance to answer, ask questions. Jennifer, this is Tessa and I have a question for you. Yes, go Tessa. So you talked about a good way to improve EI skills um, involves getting feedback from trusted friends and colleagues. My question is, for folks that might not be aware of what EI involves or what a leader with good emotional intelligence is around, do you have any advice for what type of questions that we could ask of our colleagues and our friends that may, may not be aware of what that looks like? Absolutely. That's a really good question. You don't need to have to give them a dissertation on what it is and then say, okay, so how's this going? I think that's a really good point. So a few questions that you might consider asking are um, something like, how, how am I approachable? You know, it, is it, when I presented at, at this meeting, um, did you sense that people were engaged or frustrated? Um, do you think that I manage my emotions well, or do you think that I kind of go off the deep end? <laughs> you know, you could also ask, do you think that I pay attention well to others? Um, am I interacting well or positively with others? And just kind of get some feedback and you could give some specific situations. I think that's the other piece that can be helpful to say, you know, during this work group meeting, when we had that difficult conversation about which radon objective to pick, um, do you think that folks really were um, in agreement or um, how we move forward or did I ignore some of the people in the room? So again, I guess take some specific examples, uh, but then ask some questions that kind of get feedback on how you were perceived and how you were received and how you were managing your own emotions. Great. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. I have a question for you too, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, my question is for I, th I think there are some folks who are naturally will buy in to the idea of emotional t intelligence and others for whom that's it's kind of a a farther reach and i'm i'm wondering if you have any advice for um communicating the importance of considering emotional intelligence um especially to to folks who are so busy and we're very um uh, into our evidence-based lives um, as we should be. But anyway, um, how, how would you suggest trying to communicate to folks where this might not be a natural idea for them, um, the importance of considering it? Well, I would say kind of pulling back and we'll follow up on this again, looking back at the why we want to do it. And so say, you know what, I want to make sure we're building trust. I want to make sure there's strong relationships. I want to make sure we're engaging people so that we can be productive moving forward. And you don't even have to use the word emotional intelligence. I think what I've learned um, is even though I'm a geek about it and I love to talk about it, it's not something that necessarily everybody wants to talk about. And if you even say the word, there's going to be some people who are like, oh, she's a feeler. Oh, this is getting too touchy feely for me. So they kind of shut down. But when you say to them, you know what, we want to make sure that we are engaging our consortium in the most positive way possible. We want to make sure that the relationships are being strongly built and that people are maintained in this place. We want to make sure we're building trust. And so those are kind of some of the out, the symptoms of that or kind of what you can see as a result of that. Um, outcomes is what I meant, not symptoms, but outcomes. And so focusing on that area, I think can be um, better than even saying emotional intelligence. So do we want to be more productive? Yes. So let's try to make sure we ask some good questions and acknowledge that some people may or may not agree with us at any given time. You know, do we want to build trust? Yes. So we want to make sure when somebody asks a question that we respect them and their response. So again, you know, practicing the, the, how you do it without even saying the words, I think can be really helpful. Thank you. And it sounds like it's about to storm here. So it's getting darker. So if you're <laughs> wondering what's going on, I'm not going to go turn a light on, but I'm, yeah, I'm still here. I'm not pulling the power. You can still, see me. <laughs> you can still see me, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> But I, yeah, I want to give you a heads up. I hear thunder behind me and I see the screen's getting dark. So hopefully all will be well. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed for you, but we can still see it just fine. Good. Uh, other questions? People are soaking it in, Jennifer. So no questions right at the moment. 
it looks like. Do you have additional material you want to share with us? I have a couple more okay. things. I want to um, remind you guys of some things we've learned and give you an action step for the end of this um, webinar. So, so three key points kind of that I want you guys to remember after today. I want you to remember what is emotional intelligence, why it's important for coalition building, and how we can improve on emotional intelligence skills that we've talked about a little bit. So in depth, what is it? It's recognizing, managing, understanding, and influencing emotions, both in ourselves, and in others. So again, it's paying attention. It's getting to know yourself, recognizing that emotions are at play, even if people don't realize it. And you don't have to go and tell them you have emotions at play. <laughs> you can just recognize that and adjust and think and ask questions accordingly. That's what EI really is, is recognizing, managing, understanding, and influencing emotions in yourself and in others. Why is it important? We've talked about this um, a little bit. It's important in leadership. It's important in relationships, and it's important to build trust, it's important to have engaged participants, and it's important to move forward in a productive way. All of these come together, and again, like the question from earlier was fantastic. Regardless of whether you are the leader at the time or not, you can demonstrate leadership in emotional intelligence that helps your whole coalition or really consortium move forward in a positive, productive way to really achieving the kind of health outcomes you're looking for. And then finally, how can we improve emotional intelligence skills? We can ask for feedback. This could be in a conversation, this could be in a survey, this could be a lot of different ways. We can observe, pay attention to what's happening around us in our relationships. And this could be um, in our relationships in a work setting. This could be also personal. There's a lot we can learn personally. Um, I know you may be able to hear little um, voices in the background. I have an 18 month old um, who's downstairs uh, and you know, one of the things I've had to really learn is how do I observe her emotions? Like I can see she's got emotions, but she can't really say a lot of words yet. So I'm really constantly improving my emotional intelligence skills to say what's going on here and how can I coach her in those emotions? Um, the other thing is observe people who do it well and imitate those folks. And then finally, I'm going to encourage you to reflect. And again, I know it seems like a foreign concept and it can be really difficult um, to reflect um, and take the time to pause, to not look at your phone and maybe pick up something to write in, you know, like actually handwriting. No, this is crazy. Um, but reflect, take notes, acknowledge what might be going on um, and, and see what might be happening there. So here's what I want you all to do um, to take some action on this. So here's our action steps. So what I would like for you guys to do to apply this stuff is by this Friday, June the 15th, I want you guys to schedule 15 minutes, put 15 minutes on your calendar to reflect on how you would like to improve your emotional intelligence skills and write down just one thing that you'd like to do to improve over the next month. Bonus, if you want to do, and you may have be done with your reflection sooner, um, or you may want to take this a step further, share with somebody you trust what you wrote down and ask them to check back with you on July 15th see how you've done. And then the final piece is I would love for you guys to visit my website and blog um, for additional ways to help people work better together. I am trying to blog weekly on practical things we can do to really make that happen. Uh, and so I encourage you guys to, to visit that website uh, and, and provide some feedback. I'd love comments or suggestions and, and you know, let me know um, how this is working for you and how that can be improved. So the action steps, as a reminder, by this Friday, schedule 15 minutes to really reflect and figure out one thing you want to do to improve. If you want to be an overachiever, share with that with somebody um, and have them check back with you by July 15th and visit jredmanknight.com for additional ways to connect with people. So with that, I just want to thank you um, for your time today. And uh, if there's any final questions, I'm glad to answer those, but um, the content is done. 
Thank you so much. If you have final questions, we'll take those in the chat box in the QA really quickly. I don't see any right now. So Jennifer, let me take this opportunity to thank you so much for your great content, for your uh, presentation. And I will um, echo Jennifer's call to visit her blog. It really is good food for thought. She's blogged about a lot of what we've talked about here today and what we will talk about in the continuation of the series, so next week and the week after. Speaking of that, I'm going to put back in the chat box a couple links for you. Um, the first is the link to read about the other events in the series, and then I'm also going to share a link to an evaluation for this series. Would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we take that very seriously in um, shaping the type of educational opportunities that are offered through the consortium. So we would love to hear what you think and how this session worked for you. And I know Jennifer would um, love that feedback as well. Absolutely. I don't see any other questions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope that you will all join us next week um, where we're going to talk about some consensus building, which I think is something we can all use in many situations, including within our work groups um, and other coalitions that we might be participating in. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll hopefully see you next week. <laughs>